Continuing on in our series called Heading Home, and it's a series about if I'm heading in the right direction and I'm doing the right things, why is life so hard? And uh, I think all of us have experienced moments like that. So today we're in Hebrews chapter 13, and we're going to begin in verse 1, where it says, Keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing so, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. Continue to remember those in prison as if you were together with them in prison, and those who are mistreated as if you yourselves were suffering. Marriage should be honored by all and the marriage bed kept pure, for God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? The fundamental thing that we have to think through is when we start or engage in a life of faith, how does that affect the rest of our lives? Because it would be a horrible miscalculation to think that the only thing that matters is what we do together for an hour on Sunday. And lots of people consider a life of faith to be a way to protect themselves from other things in life and to close their life off to things that they are anxious about. The truth is, is that when it comes to our life of faith, it's not about closing ourselves up and protecting, but faith opens our lives in remarkable ways, and we find ways to give of ourselves into our world. So the question is, do we pursue a life of faith to close off and protect or to open and to give? And this goes back a little bit to what we talked about last week where there's two mountains, and one is Mount Sinai, and Mount Sinai is all about the rules. And Mount Sinai has ropes up at the bottom. Nobody's allowed up that mountain to get close to God. And then there's another mountain, Mount Zion. And Mount Zion is all about the relationships. And the ropes have been taken down and the veil has been torn. And it's all about relationship. And the, the mountain we choose to see from will affect our perspective in every single area of our lives. So here's what I want you to know this morning. Just the thought as we wade into some really challenging texts. And that is, it isn't possible to open your life to God and close it to people. If if you're opening your life to God, it's going to open your life to other people in ways that will startle you and surprise you. And this passage actually deals with some very demanding concepts, and we're going to wade through into that today. The first thing it tells us in verse 1 is that we're called to love other Christ followers as brothers and sisters. As brothers and sisters. I actually grew up in a church where we would call each other brother and sister. I know that's kind of faded out in in, in common uh, experience, but if a person was a, a follower of Jesus, we would actually say brother and their name or sister and their name. This is not saying to put a name in front. In fact, I've got one brother and uh, uh, three sisters, and and I never said brother and then their name. Uh, I just called them by their name. But we're called to be, we're called to love as brothers and sisters. So let me just check. How many of you grew up with at least one or more siblings in the house with you? Yeah, quite the experience, isn't it? Uh, How many discovered that you all looked exactly alike? Yeah, the same body type. uh, Even in identical twins, there's quite a bit of difference. And anyone who knows them really well can tell that difference pretty quickly. So... Certainly there's similarities, like you might have your father's eyes or your mother's smile or your grandfather's temper or your grandmother's wit. There's similarities, but you're not replicas. Uh, In your siblings, did you all like the exact same music? Yeah, no, no. You you thought what your siblings liked was stupid. (laughs) 
And not only did you not like the music that they liked and the artists that they liked, you didn't like the volume they listened to it at. That would really annoy you too. You didn't like the same movies. You didn't like the same actors. You didn't like the same TV shows. And, and how many have discovered if you grew up in a family, you all had the exact same political view? No? This is why you're not allowed to talk about politics at Thanksgiving dinner because the turkey will not be the only casualty. It's not going to go well for somebody. You have different food preferences. And, and you probably complained at some point or another about how difficult those people made your life in that place. And you maybe even looked forward to the day when you didn't have to interact with them so frequently. But the truth is, they were your brother and your sister. Uh, you probably had different academic abilities. Maybe you were smart and they weren't, didn't perform as well academically, or the other way around. You probably had different interests in sports and hobbies. You liked different authors. Maybe you liked different books. Maybe you didn't like to read at all. And did you ever have a disagreement with your sibling? Oh, yes. And in your disagreement, did you ever raise your voice? Oh, yes. And when you were raising your voice, did you ever have a fight? Oh, yes. But did you ever think in that moment they were not your brother and sister? It might have annoyed you even more that they were. But you never thought that they weren't. So why is this important? Because grace creates a personal connection that is greater than a personal preference or personal opinion. Your family. And as different as you all are, you all belong. Uh, you, you might be frustrated at the conversations that happen among siblings. And you might have even said things in frustration to your sibling, but when somebody else says it, you say, hey, that's my brother, that's my sister. And if your sibling really needed something, didn't you come through for them? And didn't they come through for you? And I know some of you are sitting here going, still waiting on that one. <laughs> Here's the challenge, is that when religious communities are built on the same things they like or the same things they dislike, it's no longer a family of grace. They're not camped out on Mount Zion, where it's all about relationship. They're camped out on Mount Sinai, where it's all about the rules. If we all have to like the exact same things in order to get together, whatever else it is we are, we're not a family. And God calls us to be a family of grace. And then not only does he kind of give this insight to us about brothers and sisters, he goes a little bit further and he tells us that we are called to love strangers. Not just love the people you know, but love strangers, people that you don't know. The word hospitality literally is the, the word in the original Greek for love of strangers. It's a really cool concept. So love of strangers. Show hospitality to strangers. Uh, our culture isn't really good at this. Uh, most people try to find the tribe they belong in and then just kind of hang out with those people. Grace doesn't help, just help you love people who have experienced God's grace. It helps you actually show love to people you don't even know and haven't yet experienced God's grace. That's a really interesting thing. It's a way to treat people so that when you interact with them, you are warm, you are friendly, you are generous. It's a really interesting concept. It's sharing your space and what you have with someone you don't know. It's a really intriguing concept, and we're not good about it. We've been told since we were little kids, don't talk to strangers, and the Bible is telling us something quite different. If you've ever been a stranger and been shown hospitality, you know how life-giving that is. If you've been in a place where you didn't know anyone and you felt a little isolated, if someone came up and they were warm and welcoming to you and helped you out, that meant a great deal. Hospitality says, I am glad you are here and I have something to share with you. Grace requires that we actually share what we have even with those that we don't know. This is a very different way to think in our world. Now, I know this never happens in our church, but I hear it happens in some. Where you walk in 
and you go to the place that you most frequently sit, and someone is already there. <laughs> and you might, you might say, I excuse me. You're sitting in, what's the next word? Oh, my seat. What makes that your seat? Why is that your seat? Well, everybody knows that's where, I, well, obviously they did not. So what makes it your seat that you have sat in it more times? Like, is it a rule thing? If someone sits in it five times and you sit in it six times, that's your seat? So, oh, well, pastor, <laughs> you know, I don't like to brag, but I, I actually make a, a fair amount of financial contribution to this place. So, you know, that, that, I've paid for that seat many times over. So what mountain are you on now? Are you on the Grace Mountain or are you on the Rule Mountain? I've said in it more times than I've given more money that makes it mine. That's no place to live. Um, one Sunday, we, we had a really full house and, and, and there were people sitting in the seat that I usually sit in and it was funny to watch the worship team. They all wanted to see what I would do. <laughs> Because you preach about that not being your suit, but there they are. <laughs> They're in it. And I just walked right by and went and found a seat because being a pastor doesn't give me a seat. It, it does give me a platform, but that's not quite the same thing. <laughs> and that's kind of the point, isn't it? We need to learn how to operate with hospitality because when we show <laughs> hospitality, even to strangers, we, grace helps us use our resources to build community not just our identity. I, I, I love really nice cars. When, when I see a really expensive car go by, I notice. And, and my wife is also corrupted by this sickness that we have. She, she had a car go by her the other day that she had a visceral reaction to. She looked it up. We will never own that car. <laughs> For two reasons. One is we can't afford that car. And the other is it goes from zero to 60 in 2.6 seconds, which makes holding onto the steering wheel a challenge. Like it's, it's actually pulling away from you. We use our resources to prove to people who we are. This is the neighborhood I live in. This is the car I drive. These are the clothes that I wear. And Grace says, no, nope. you use your resources to build community, not to prove who you are to other people. What an incredibly different way to live. You realize that God has actually blessed you with something so that you can help build community with other people. Most people only use their resources just to Put the image forward because we want people to know who we are or at least who we want to be. So the author of Hebrews says that people who are hospitable to strangers have actually, on occasion, shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. My first takeaway of this is nobody you know is an angel. And some of you go, well, I already knew that part, so let's move on. So it goes back to a story in Genesis chapter 18. It's a reference. Remember, Hebrews is filled with insider stories and insider language. And this is a reference back to a guy named Abraham in Genesis chapter 18, where three strangers were walking by his tent. And he went out to them, and he bowed down, showing respect, and he invited them to rest under a tree so they could get some shade and provide them some water. And then he had some food made for them, so he showed respect to them, and he provided refreshment for them, and he gave nourishment to them, and all of this was out of his own pocket. He, he didn't say, if you've got some money, I'll take care of you. This wasn't a, a, a hotel situation. It, he was just being hospitable, and he didn't know that these were actually angels, and in the course of the conversation, one of those angels shared that the long-awaited promise that God had made years before was going to happen within the next year. And he didn't know that's who he was talking to. 
the author of Hebrews actually tells us in the first chapter that angels are ministering spirits sent from God to minister on our behalf. Scripture reveals that angels are not these, these creatures that show up with, 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 with swords and, and, and wings and, and, and terrify everyone. That has happened in Scripture, but most likely they show up as strangers who speak a word that encourage and re-encourage us in a promise that God has made and maybe even provide some insight into something that he's going to do and when. He said, so be hospitable to strangers. I, what if God sent, I don't think he sends angels incognito to Calvary Assembly to give us a rating on our hospitality. And I don't think they report back and go, yeah, they dropped the ball a little bit today. There were no chocolate donuts left. <laughs> I don't think that's what it's about. I do think it is about an opportunity to speak into our lives, to encourage our lives, because they're helping carry out the will of God. In fact, if you remember last week, it actually said on Mount Zion, the different mountain that our whole faith is built on now. On that mountain, there are thousands upon thousands of angels who are all gathered in joyful assembly. It's a really cool concept. So grace uses resources to build community. Grace undermines selfishness. Grace undermines selfishness. So we share what we have with brothers and sisters, and we share what we have with strangers. Let me just give you a couple of a quick uh, updates. I am so incredibly thrilled about this. If you remember about a month ago, we showed a video conversation that I had with one of our missionaries. His name is Tim, and he had an opportunity to purchase a piece of property in Ecuador uh, that for $5,000. And on this property, they were going to build a seminary and a leadership training place. And so they just needed $5,000. And, and we're right in the middle of a capital campaign. We're doing our own building expansion project. And it would be so easy just to think, you know, we'll do stuff like that after we get in our new space. But we had the conversation with you, and our promise was if we raise more than $5,000, we'll send all of whatever comes in to them, because not only will they buy the property, but it will help start the building project. Last week, we sent the final check to them, and the total was $13,553. <laughs> Isn't that great? I love that we can be generous with people we will never see and don't know their language, but because we believe they are brothers and sisters in Christ, we can share what we have. And they're going to use that place. To, and, and not only that, a lot of us are, are, are giving sacrificially out of our resources to increase and expand our facility, not just so that we have a better space for us, but more space for others so that we can show hospitality to those who come in. And we've not asked our community for any money for that. We'll say, we'll write that check. Now, I know there are some people who go, well, it might change us. I've seen this happen. And this is what I want you to know. More square footage doesn't change who we are. Being less hospitable, that changes who we are. Not caring about our community and them getting to experience the grace of God for themselves. That will change who we are. Whatever we have to do to make sure the doors stay open and people can connect with the grace of God, we're willing to do that because grace resources community. And grace will undermine selfishness. Now, here's the thing you need to know about the rest of this message. I am going to two places that Christian pastors are never supposed to talk about. And there's a high likelihood that you are going to misunderstand something that I say. And a lot of you are going to think that I have weighed into politics now. And what you should know is I am. <laughs> but not the way, yes. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> but not the way that you think. Grace undermines selfishness regardless of our ideology or political views. Now, let me explain. In, in political ideology, there are people who tend to be a little bit more conservative and people who tend to be a little bit more liberal or progressive, right? And so you already know like where you stand on those issues. And I'm not interested in a conversation about that today. But if you lean towards the more conservative side of things, your view will be something like this, as a rule. you know, Personal choices 
are the primary thing. And I think I'm responsible for my life, and so I'm going to do what I can to take care of myself and my family, and I don't need someone else telling me how to spend my money. And then we run smack dab into this passage of Hebrews where it says, you're supposed to love as brothers and sisters, which means not only do you know each other really well, but you share what you have, and you're even supposed to show hospitality to strangers, which comes out of your pocket. And then if that's not enough, because like the Bible, once it starts driving a point home, it goes deep. If that's not enough, then it, the Bible goes on to say, and those who are in prison, remember them as if you were one of their fellow prisoners. Now there's two kinds of people in jail. People who are guilty, and people who are wrongly accused and found guilty. And you can't tell which one you're talking to. I've spent a lot of time in jails. I can't tell. But God doesn't say that if you can tell if they're guilty, you're off the hook. He says, we have a responsibility to minister to and serve them and remember them just like we, and then it doesn't stop there because the Bible just keeps piling on. It, then it goes on to say, and those who have been mistreated, I want you to connect with them in a way like you were the one being mistreated. And this has to do with issues of injustice where, where people have been, had something withheld from them or they've not been given opportunity, whatever it is. And, and I know some of you right now are going, oh, great, there it is. Well, now we're one of those churches. And just hang on because I'm not going after your political party. I'm going after your selfish heart. And if you're on the liberal side of this, just hang on. Your minute is coming. <laughs> and more conservative-leaning people will say, it's my money, and no one's going to tell me what to do with it. And Grace says, you need to rethink that. Now, some of you who lean a little bit more liberal, uh, you're going, ha, finally, truth was spoken in this house. It's about time. Oh, there's a way selflessness shows up in the liberal side, too. And uh, that shows up more in sexual lifestyle issues. And the Bible went there, too, didn't it? Marriage is honorable. The bed is to be kept pure. God will judge the idolater and all sexual immorality. You see, conservatives tend to say, you can't tell me what to do with my money. And liberals tend to say, you can't tell me what to do with my sex life. I'll share my resources, but I'll do what I want when I'm in bed. Well, the Bible goes after that selfishness too. Because in Scripture, when it talks about sexual intimacy, Scripture is not opposed to sexual intimacy. I know it's an uncomfortable topic for lots of religious environments. But scripture actually supports sexual intimacy. In fact, it was God who created the idea. The problem is not that God is opposed to sexual intimacy. The challenge for us is that God says to share the deepest part of your heart should require the highest level of commitment. And what scripture reveals is, is that if you want to experience the pleasure of someone without making a commitment, the baseline reason for that is selfishness. I want to, be, to experience pleasure, and I want that now without any promises. What does that sound like? Now, I know there's some people who go, oh, it's not like that, Pastor. No, I just love them so much. I want to give myself completely to them. Okay. So, you want to give yourself completely without making a promise or without waiting for a promise. I love you so much, I have to have you right now. Does that sound like love or selfishness to you? See, selfishness worms its way into whatever our ideology and political alignment is. And you should know, Scripture will offend you at the point of your selfishness. God has not called the church to just say whatever needs to be said to fill a room. God calls 
us to speak a message of grace that says, no matter where selfishness hides in your heart, it needs to be exposed and it needs to be dealt with because grace will change your life and grace will change our world and nothing else can or will. That's the difference. So, sex and politics. And you're saying, dear God, is this message almost done? Because... <laughs> All right, so why does, well, some people might say, I'm not really that selfish, I can be generous. We're, we all have a way that we're generous, but it lines up with our ideology, and we all have a way that we're selfish, and that submits to our ideology. And grace undermines selfishness. It, it doesn't matter whether you lean conservative or liberal. We're all hardwired for selfishness, and grace comes to challenge it. And the scripture revealed one more important thing just before we're done here today, and that is the root of selfishness is the fear of loneliness. This is a remarkable insight. That often when we want something or we're unwilling to share something, it's because we're afraid that we're going to be left alone. The fear of being alone will actually drive us into relationships that are not good for us. And we will tolerate people who are untrustworthy and disrespectful because that is less important to us than being alone. That's a really hard place to be in life. And the fear of being all by ourselves just drives us into relationships that aren't good, or we can be in a relationship and we're not being respected and there are unhealthy things that are happening and we won't challenge it because we're afraid they will leave us. And that fear of loneliness drives us, in, and, and it's fascinating. It looks like these are isolated things that, they, that the author of Hebrews is just peppering in before he closes out the letter, and it's not. He's making a connection that there's selfishness that drives us, and there's a fear that drives our selfishness, and the fear is that we will be left utterly alone, and none of us want that. So we will obtain and acquire and achieve in order to attract the people that we want, and we won't challenge the things that we should because we're afraid we'll be left alone, and God comes crashing through just just as he's calling us to highest levels of commitment, he reveals to us that he has already made it. Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. When will God walk out on you? Never. When will God abandon you? Never. What have you done? It doesn't matter. God won't abandon you. He doesn't wait for us to be worthy of the commitment that he's going to make. He makes it up front and he pays the price for it. You talk about complete hospitality. He opens his arms wide as strange and stained with sin as we may be and he welcomes us in and he pays the price for all of it because he is willing to make the commitment. If you want to know what love is, look for the commitment. And God made the ultimate commitment. He sends his son who gives his life so that you and I would never have to be alone ever again. And once you know that, it doesn't mean that if people walk out on you, it doesn't hurt. It will. It'll frustrate you. You'll lose sleep. You'll be anxious but it doesn't destroy you because there's still one who will not leave you no matter what. And you can talk to him any time and he will speak to you. And that makes all the difference. Let's bow our heads this morning. So it, it's entirely possible that I said something that you just, it, it turned you off and now you, you didn't hear anything after something I said. And my goal was not to be, um, my goal was not to be objectionable. My goal was just to pull back the curtain that we hide over our heart. I'm capable of remarkable selfishness. And 
in my world, I can do it in ways that make me look good. If you hang around the right people and you say the right words, you'll be applauded for a way that you're selfish. And scripture just comes crashing through and says, it's a horrible way to live. And when we live that way, our community just keeps getting smaller because you're eventually going to find something you don't like. And our world keeps getting darker because we keep closing the doors. And so God's word says, I've shared something with you so that you can share it with others. That requiring higher levels of commitment is evidence of love, not of some kind of silly, archaic, outdated standard. And when we live it out, we get so frustrated because other people don't. When we live it out, they see how it works. And that's the difference. So I'm going to ask you a couple questions this morning. And when I ask these questions, I just want you to ask God, just, just quietly in your heart, how would you like me to respond to this and see if he brings something to your mind? So the first question is this. If you were going to show hospitality to strangers in our gatherings, what would that look like for you? Like when we show up here on a Sunday, if you were going to do that, what would that look like for you? Just take like 10 seconds and think about that. Here's a question. When was the last time that you had someone in your home that wasn't a family member or already a good friend? Would you consider opening your door to someone you don't know as well? Now, when I ask that question, I'd just like you to ask God, who might that be, and see who comes to your mind. Who might you want to welcome to a table to share a meal with? There's something remarkable that happens when we eat together. We don't just open our mouths to chew, we open our hearts to share. Who might God be interested in you inviting to a table? Maybe it's at your home, maybe it's at a diner or cafe or restaurant. Just take 10 seconds and see if God brings someone to your mind. And then are there ways that you could serve others and share what you have? Are there ways to do that? Just take 10 seconds and see if God shows you something or just brings something to your mind. So Father, thank you for being so generous and hospitable with us. Thank you for considering us your children. Thank you for making the highest commitment and paying the greatest price. And thank you for the opportunity to share what you've entrusted with us, with others. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together.